Welcome back, everyone, to The Harbor. I'm your host, the Kino Cowboy, the King of Okino. I'm here with Scott and Casher, like usual. You look like you're in a fucking prison room. <laughs> I'm in a shot from Possession 1981. I'm stuck. I've been stuck in here since the last cast. <laughs> uh, but we're going to continue some of our body horror. And it, I figured, why not? Month of October. Hope everyone's having a cool, spooky season so far. I've been kind of behind on horror movies, but I'm going to watch a few pretty soon. Um, Anyway, we're doing Tetsuo, the Iron Man. No MCU jokes this episode, please. I've had enough with reading that uh, AV uh, article against Scorsese. I've had Uh, enough. Get off my lawn. Yeah. So anyway, it is a very influential experimental film from the late eighties from Shinya Tsukamoto. And it's one of those, one of those movies you appreciate for being so low budget and so insane and crazy. And you can't believe it's one of those movies that exists aesthetically. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like a movie that would only exist in this form. And I know he's made sequels, but like at the time, you can see yeah like it's it's almost like cronenberg x uh yeah like uh like Raimi. yeah like it's one What's of a wild kind. to me is that this and akira came out like the same time because akira incorporates a lot of mechanical body horror yeah it does it, it's interesting which is like are they homies like, no but it does uh I do like that imagery at the end of Vakura, but this takes that just to the next level. And, you know, I think a movie like this, when you're working with no budget, you have to work on it for quite some time. And uh, this is my second time watching this. This really struck me back in the uh, college years. The When I was 19 till about 22, that's when I started diving deep into uh, cinema as a whole beyond the whole imdb kind of core and this is one of the movies that stuck out to me just something just off the wall crazy super um influential to me anything like this is just like you know he probably had uh probably had some issues trying to get it finished because i remember reading that he ran out of budget and shit and he had to like make a trailer for it to try and get the funding finished and yeah it's it's always admirable there's always this extreme super hard idea that directors have they just want to see the vision completed and and you just like to see it in its full in its full form and i do like that it's just this 67 minute insane chaotic that shit fucking movie well it's like this whole thing doesn't have like a a conventional narrative itself but like yeah. just explores the almost like organic material combined with metallic sexuality it's fucking interesting no there, there's definitely i mean there's a, definitely a storyline but i i had trouble piecing it together not so much trouble piecing it together but while watching i was coming up with multiple possible theories to explain what's happening on the screen. Um, So basically this is a movie where three people can watch the same movie and come away with in essence, three different narratives uh, that they watched. Um, I mean, the broad strokes are the same, but uh, some of the motivations of the characters, for instance, um, like I, I'm still not a hundred percent sure uh how the antagonist plays into it. Um I don't know. And it was definitely interesting to watch this movie, which I watched for the first time. I've been putting it off forever. 
Um, it was a lot more Power Rangersy than I thought it would be. <laughs> in, in some of the costuming and kung fu fighting yeah. that's going on, it's very um, Toho Kaiju y. And that's to- his, Toho Kaiju y. Yes. He's like, uh, he's a big, big fan of that sort of stuff, was which I was reading. And I was, that was right. the first which- thing. I I went into this expecting a horror movie, and I expected something a little more um, macabre, I guess. I mean, it's so gross. You have people shoving metal rods into themselves and stuff. Yeah, I uh, think you're just uh, a patrician who's desensitized, because any normal person watching this movie will be like, Jesus fucking Christ, because it just comes at you nonstop. Is it, patri- is it being a patrician not fucking caring about disgusting sexual mechanic no, I'm violence. I'm saying like the, the insane <laughs> fucked up imagery of this movie is intense and it, there's it, some pretty insane imagery and I think a lot of it's just I mean it opens that. with one of the most intense like stabbing and then like with the budget that this has I'm glad they did a black and white for one yeah well that's uh, probably and, necessity for a budget yeah but also uh, but like style. watching him rip open his thigh shove that pipe in yeah, and the maggots growing from that's it. That's awesome. Like that's so dope to start. That's an with. That's instant so filtering scene. Like yeah. either you're in or out immediately. <laughs> and, and like uh, there's just there's a few scenes where it's like either you're in or out, and then you might be in, and then you get to certain scenes you're like, okay, I'm out now. Uh, <laughs> like and, uh, this film consist is like just a consistent filter. It's like myself personally, I can't handle like hyper realistic gore. A lot of it, but I love this kind of gore. It's just like, see, and that's why it's like old Cronenberg's my shit. I hated Crimes of the Future though, yeah, because of just like it's just gore for gore sake. Too much for you, yeah. It's just yeah. Which uh, some people might call this gore for gore's sake. Like, what's the true? The, no, there's the there's a uh, there's a good reason behind it, and I think the reason behind it is. Well, it's kind of a, uh, it's a different culture, you know, Japanese culture. And, and uh, the whole point is that the the guy who's, you know, who hits him with the car, the, one of the main characters, is a salary man. And not only is he a salary man, but that's the only thing he goes by. There's no actual character name, which means he's the exemplary call, uh, salary man. And in Japan... It's a very big part of their culture. It's the white collar guy who works fucking 16 to 18 hours a day, puts in overtime anywhere he can, spends all of his free time out with his coworkers, drinks a lot, goes to karaoke, et cetera, et cetera. And I've seen this character a lot throughout Japanese media. And it's, and it's sometimes even romanticized in a way. And uh, it seems like he's really just commenting on this kind of way of living. And also, uh, we have that kind of thing over here, but it's not the same exactly. And I feel like, because, you know, they have like suicide nets over there for overworked white collar people. And just like it's there's people dying at their office. There's a few differences. Um, one is in America, at least nowadays, we do not stay with the same company for 20, 30, 40, 50, our whole career, um, like they commonly do. Uh, that's where the company loyalty really comes in. Um, and also, you don't leave till your boss leaves, whether or not you have work to do. I feel like maybe Americans are a bit more pragmatic in how they spend their time. Um, yeah. Like they work a lot, but not for no reason. Um or not, or not I don't know. Some people try to look busy. Sometimes I, I do want to say the 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 commentary on salary man. So I guess since this maybe has become more negative in light, like there's a lot of like media uh, and shows and things like that that really don't paint the salary man life as a good life as common as it has been. Like just in recent memory, like sure. there's whole shows dedicated. Like I've been watching one uh that's called Zom One Hundred Bucket List of the Dead. And like this dude is a uh he's a salary man 
and the zombie apocalypse comes in and the first thing that comes to mind is he's like i don't have to go to work tomorrow like and that type of commentary where he's going to do yeah. everything he wants to do um before you know he becomes a zombie in case but it's like it seems like that it, it, it's crazy to me that there's been commentary like this out there since you know the late 80s and there's not been any kind of change in that well it's yeah very much seen at least back in the day it's like the noble thing to do in their culture is to do as much as you can and, and put as much effort and work as you can into it and it's just shit if i was uh, over there and i didn't even have a family or anything fuck no i'm not gonna be spending my whole time fucking working Hell you'd be no. one of those guys in your room that has like rare anime figures and like, yeah like a hikikomori like you don't yeah. leave your room yeah you, where like there's trash everywhere and like only room for your bed and tv makeup yeah and, and your ray eye and ami sex doll <laughs> okay what okay i'm, yeah, the that, least, that's, I'm I mean, one of the least weeby friends we have yeah but if you go to japan adrian that that would be your thing that's what I'd you be a neat do. for sure that's for damn sure i'd well find some way to not the, work the, the reason, so look, cyberpunk as a genre is, for whatever reason, heavily tied to the 1980s in Japan when they were in an economic boom, which in uh, 91, uh, or from 1986 to 1991, according to Wikipedia, there was an economic bubble, uh, which then later burst. And so this movie was released in 89. So this is at the tail end of this bubble and this economic boom where, you know, I mean, Westerners thought Japan would overtake the U.S. economy, you know, because they started making cars there. And oh, no, Cody. what's going to happen? Um, And I, I think this movie and, and a lot of cyberpunk, all of cyberpunk, because I guess we made enough electronics, consumer electronics in Japan um, comes from. All of that, all of that economic. I mean, from Neuromancer onward and Snow Crash in the yeah. literature, um, it's all heavily in Snow Crash. The guy's a street samurai. That's basically where the uh, cyberpunk, um, hell, that's a class in Shadowrun. Um, well, I was going to say, you mentioned cyberpunk like that. And, uh, there's the concept of that, of like the tech that you're using inevitably poisons you, uh, makes you, drives you insane. Right, and if if you deal with a very traditional society like Japan, watch any Miyazaki movie, um, you deal with the industrialization and the globalization that are traditionally isolationist, albeit empirical, um, imperial, rather, um, society has had. Like, once, you know, uh, telecommunications become more and more enveloping, um, and you also have a culture that is uh, in many ways socially conservative and people feel isolated. So then they feel like their only connection to the world in these hyper urbanized crowded environments are through screens, are through media. Um, you, you end up with a uh, kind of a difficult social situation that I think we didn't really appreciate in the West until relatively recently. Uh, when we had four chainers storming the White House, and we were like, "Oh, you know, maybe, uh, maybe we do have our own problems." Except yeah. instead of banging Ray Ayanami sex dolls, people are taking out their weird sexual frustration on the White House. I don't know. This is very rambling, but it's all connected somehow. I gotta figure it out oh, for sure. And that's the beauty of it. And um, but I just feel like. The more the salary man runs from this, the more he gets uh, taken by it and the more he transforms into this. And it feels like this inevitable thing. And right. And it's the inevitable march of progress consuming him as an individual and society writ large consuming him as an individual. Uh, it's also a giant metaphor for him suppressing his homosexuality. There's also that angle you could easily take. Yeah, there's definitely some... Uh fear of i don't know may possibly emasculating or i don't know because yeah what is the sexuality of this movie trying to say because at first he has that dream where he's getting uh ass fucked 
But I mean, you For know, buy a machine. I, I, I like that. I like that you spend so much time to find a better word, and you just come up with S. Yeah, that's a, <laughs> I was like, I should. I was gonna. I, I was sodomized. thinking. I was trying to remember the word sodomized, and I couldn't remember it. I just said ass fuck, you know. But yeah, like, uh, we're getting fucked by corporations. That's what it is. Uh, maybe it's interesting for sure. But uh, because then he tries to have sex with his girlfriend, and his dick is becoming that fucking drill thing, which is fucking awesome. It's gnarly, but like he's obviously freaked out by it, and she stabs him in the neck. And he tries to hide his transformation. Is it? It's almost like a techno werewolf with weird phallic imagery and shit. I don't know, but I'm trying to decipher what all the sex uh, yeah. parts. And that's the fun of it. And um, also, I don't know. Maybe the director, writer, director wasn't trying to say anything. It was just cool imagery. Um. I don't know, maybe the guy's a porn addict. And this is all about how um, <laughs> porn VHS tapes have taken over his life and ruined his relationship. Yeah, maybe. And, but, and, and ruined his expectations of sex. This is called Ted Swill the Iron Man, not Scott the Keith Man. Yeah, well, <laughs> you're not wrong. But <laughs> I don't know, maybe yeah. the guy's spending too much time uh, watching weird Japanese VHS tapes. He has some sort of problem because there's that scene where she's like eating a sausage, which of course is phallic. And the sounds she's making while she's eating it is like causing him actual physical pain. And then, and it's like, what's your deal? Are you emasculated? What? And then right after that, that's when his dick transforms into a (laughs) giant drill and shit, which looks fucking (laughs) cool. I will say. (laughs) And then, he uh this is all after they have kind of like rough sex and it gets kind of too rough and intense and uh i don't know and then she he runs off to hide his transformation but she thinks she can handle it and uh she cannot handle it she freaks the fuck out and uh i don't know what did she think was happening She's I like, really I can handle it. it. And he has like a robot hand. And she's yeah. like, oh, that's good. I've seen it before. <laughs> yeah. What do you expect? My brother had this when he was 12. Yeah. Yeah, dude. People turn to robots all the time. This is Japan. I don't know. Uh, yeah. And why is he? The yeah. Giant puberty metaphor. He's going through his second puberty. Is that where the Sam Raimi influence comes in? He's slinging a web all over his room. <laughs> Fucking thick ropes, dude. Yeah. Thick, <laughs> thick, wiry ropes for all the wires. I don't know. It's like uh, he's he, he he obviously like craves some sort of sexual nature, but also kind of like runs away from it at the same time. I don't know. Yeah, this movie's confusing. Yeah, but also like you can tell that the the inner consciousness or whatever is controlling it and working against him to keep shit going. So I don't know. I I, I, I want to talk about that. So yeah. the inner consciousness who who manifests by the end of the film as you yeah. know, who's the villain. So so he is a part of the salary man at some point in the beginning, or is piloting him or something, but also living inside his bag because he infects that random woman. Like, what is this virus and what caused it? Yeah. Well, there's the it, uh the guy who is hit by the car and then the salary man who's driving the car. So two mm-hmm. dudes. And um, yeah, I don't know what causes the first dude to insert that rebarb into his leg at the beginning. Cause yeah, I think he already had this technology mind virus. Yeah. That it de- makes him determined to completely cut himself off from humanity. A la human instrumentality. And then go full robot, you know, yeah. saying, I, I just want to be a machine. I don't want to be anything else. I want to truck along the economy and, you know, watch my screens after work um, because yeah. I don't want to be human. I don't want to, you know, have love and um, risk being heartbroken and feeling pain. I want to feel nothing. I'm going to numb myself. 
Yeah, that's interesting because so yeah, he's like that from the very beginning, and then the, the salary man fights against it the whole time until the end. He kind of has this dreamlike epiphany with the other guy, and he kind of just flips and he's like, you know what? Fuck it. I'm going to uh completely just uh, accept this fate and uh go into this too which is kind of sad if it's how i think it is and him just following suit into what society wants him to be like you said like uh you know watching screens and all day after work and yeah, stuff yeah but um i think i think at the end of the movie there's i i don't think we we here on the harbor often talk about such as with possession how much of this really happens and how much is in the character's head and with this movie it's all real i'm guaranteed it's all all <laughs> of it happened this movie yeah. is practically a documentary okay <laughs> uh, and i do think they attempt to take over the world at the end hell yeah then, then uh the fight scene is one of the coolest ex- ex- executed fights for like a low budget film because it's a bunch of like quick shots in stop motion almost. And it, it reminds me of shit. My friends and I did in middle school with our camcorder, except ours looked way shittier, but obviously this is way more expertly done, but it just has this charming quality to it. I feel. No, it does. You can tell they wanted their shonen fights, but they couldn't do it. So when a guy gets punched and this is a Raimi influence, I think from evil, Hit. when a guy yeah. gets punched he'll go down the alleyways through the streets the camera will do that at yeah. three times speed or whatever to mimic the point of view of whoever just got socked three blocks away um, yeah I which is incredibly shit. cheesy but you just have to go with it uh no i i have to i have to assume the first evil dead movie probably got a lot of young uh filmmakers or wanting to be filmmakers realize oh i can make a movie too just like clerks was for 90s uh folks and uh so i would not be surprised if there was an actual evil dead influence there well yeah there's obviously that i thought a razor head immediately it's like oh we have an industrial landscape and high yeah. contrast black and white there's also a movie have you ever seen pie directed by david darren aronofsky yeah have you seen that this movie again reminded me of that but i guess in that one the man does have a madness inside him that is growing um in a way i think that came out after this movie and darren aronofsky likes yeah i was about to say he, he he likes to take from a lot of japanese cinema yeah dude he's like i think that's smart in a weird way is i don't know like if i if i stole a bunch of stuff from indonesian cinema and showed it to westerners as my own they wouldn't know (laughs) they wouldn't know if i was like hey look at this movie and it's called the raid three i don't know (laughs) that's the best you can do is name it the raid three that's the best i can do but there's no (laughs) one (laughs) oh man no yeah but I do like when they do like form together into one thing. The shot of that, like going around town, my, my thought the whole time was like driving that giant prop around town for these shots probably was really funny and, and pretty fun. And they had no idea, probably a smaller town that they were in. So, yeah, no, it looks like they're in the suburbs to uh, avoid. It's also, it's, it's, it's a penis, dude. Like yeah. that, that thing they drive around in. Like I don't even know if you can tell there, but like look, like look at that freeze frame, dude. Yeah, he's he's coming out of a giant penis, being reborn as Tetsuo the Iron Man. Who yeah. is Tetsuo? Is Tetsuo the fusion, the Dragon Ball Z fusion at the end that they become that thing that I just showed you? Um, kinda. I don't know. Yeah, maybe. I, I well, they, they do take over the world, and I think successfully. Yeah, I would like to. And yeah, they turn everything mechanical and i do love mechanical. the imagery of um the it's beginning and when anytime they're sitting in those rooms and just surrounded by a bunch of mechanical parts and things. i was wondering what how 
Where did they get the scrap? Did they just go down to the scrap yard and get whatever shit they could for? Yeah, cheese? they had to have because there's not, there's just an obscene amount. And I was like, how is it like building those sets and navigating around it? You know, and for some reason, I thought more of the movie would be that guy in the set, like slowly creeping around. I don't know, instead <laughs> of uh, shonen fights. Well, it's like I, I, I maybe it's only the last ten minutes, Scott. Uh, there's yeah, you're right, but there's also that, and then there's also the the chick chasing them through the subway. Yeah, the rest of this feels like a fucking Evil Dead, Japanese Evil Dead, for the most part. Like, yeah, he's trying to escape her. Really escape silly edits, transformation. Like, like there's that edit where he like has the fucking motors in his feet. He's going through the city, and it just like jumps, like every every part of the way, it jumps around and spins him around, and it's like. That seems like something Raimi would do. Yeah, oh. but they, they also used the editing to obscure that they had no special effects budget whatsoever. So did Sam Raimi. I yeah. know, but like, Raimi. you can't give it all to Raimi. Like, no, obviously, I'm giving guy, it all to Raimi. This guy had his own thoughts. No, on Shinya, he just did some. He was like, I can be number two at something and picked no, uh, body horror and horror. Uh, he was like, yeah, we'll make sure an American has number one. So he made a knockoff Evil Dead. He even has three of them. Yeah, I haven't. That, seen that is the thing. It is. I did not know. I that this movie had sequels. I knew um, it had Bullet Man, but I didn't know that was related for some reason. Yeah, I I knew it, it's had sequels this whole time, but I've never checked them out. I want to watch at least the second one. But yeah, um, well, it has more of a conventional plot. Um, I don't know. Yeah. Okay. I don't, I don't need a conventional kind of like kind of like how Evil Dead Two has more of a conventional. Oh plot my god! Than Evil Dead One, yeah, sure. I don't like this bit. <laughs> yeah, and I don't even think that's necessarily true. I think it is. I think it's offensive to Japanese people. Oh, sorry guys, we have our normie friend Castro on this cast. Normie, like... we we have our uh, jingoist American <laughs> vote for the war in Iraq. Uh... <laughs> Congressman Austin here. He cast your vote for the war in Iraq. Yeah, dude. When he was that. eight years old. Back when he was a senator. <laughs> he was like, he's like, yeah, he's like, uh, what's that show? Dougie Hauser, but it's Casher at eight years old as a senator. On the National Security Council. I'm just on West Wing. Yeah. Oh, fuck. West Wing. I don't talk shit on West Wing. That's West a Wing Meemaw show. show. It's a good Meemaw show. <laughs> Yeah. Jag, do you like Jag too? No, I Jag and West that. Wing are not considered to be in the same strata of television. West okay. Wing's good. Yeah, are you saying all um all military shows are the same? The same way Cash or West Wing's not a military show. Evil Dead. Okay, well no, it's the we- you know. West Wing's not a military show. Okay, or a government show. Uh, <laughs> government. <laughs> no, it's not a military show. show. It might as well be. <laughs> Commander in chief. Well, what was okay? So the West Wing was about. You want to know what West Wing is about? The West about Wing the of the president. White House. Yeah, yeah, it's about the president. Well, yeah, I know. Like but... a dramedy. Yeah, it's awesome. I'm the just greatest it's war criminal office on cable. It's like, uh, what was it? I, I guess they're bringing Frazier back. Oh yeah, except he's not. Yeah, except no one else is in it except for him, and he's not in whatever city he was before. It's so fucking weird. And no, it's the exact example of just grasping at straws. Let's bring anything back we can that'll get 30 to 50 year old people to salivate and be like, oh, I remember this. You know, anyway, yeah. So I'm trying to think of other examples of salaryman in fiction because i've seen a lot but i can't pinpoint any of them on the spot right now um i don't know you could go with korea as a similar culture you can go yeah. with uh i um like squid games that's definitely there you get a salary yeah. man who wants to get out of his life um you have that uh you have every every anime um every anime ever made is the same. Um, <laughs> yeah, every anime is the same. Yeah, every anime is Sam Raimi. Uh, no, but a- any anime where 
it's kind of the same thing, even if they're a high schooler. And it's like, but then they discover their magic powers. I mean, it's just a it's a common storytelling trope of somebody dissatisfied in their life, and then something happens, something enters their life, whether it's a magical ring or um, a woman or anything. It's, it's just you know your standard storytelling trope. There's Western equivalents in uh, American Beauty with uh, Kevin Spacey, uh, who is not guilty. Uh, according to the courts, yeah, because he killed everyone that was around. Yeah, him. yeah, probably. I don't know. I mean, literally, the fucking witnesses have been dead. Yeah, 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 so yeah, I, yeah, 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 yeah. I looked yeah, up yeah. the numbers, and the average uh, work-related suicide in Japan is eight thousand to thirty thousand a year. So Okigahara is a thing for a reason. Yeah, that's just a. Uh, uh, you should. A, hey, I just mentioned the 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 suicide forest. You should. Splice in that Logan Paul video. Oh yeah, then we'll get views. <laughs> <laughs> How did this movie overall make you feel while you were watching it? Gnarly. That's like, it. <laughs> but like gnarly and like uh, you know how no it was like stinky poo poo movie for uh hard to be a god mm-hmm. and like wet. <laughs> this is more like a like a a sharp like rusty knife type feeling. Yeah. Yeah. It's gross. Okay. It's not a stinky poo poo movie. It's like a stinky dildo movie. <laughs> okay. This this cast I'm being, I'm giving you fucking gold here. That's good. I mean it's about giant metallic cocks. <laughs> That's true. I can't say anything against that. It is I'm gonna say claustrophobic. Yeah. Uh, there's an incredibly claustrophobic feel to this movie just because even if you are in the suburbs and not in the city center, um, these sort of winding alleyways and compact streets, because there's no street parking, uh, does give a sense of claustrophobia. And of course, the the, the entire idea of technology encroaching on you, um, which I've actually been feeling the past week or so, I feel like I need to get out into the woods or something, um, is more relevant than ever. And, and it was yeah, it's a good that they didn't film it in these big cityscape Tokyo or Kyoto shots, you know, anything like that. It's all been overdone. That's uh that's what I appreciate in a lot of like Asian horror that I've been watching lately. Uh there's like they go they don't go to these huge cities. It's usually like these like decrepit old villages or the the uh like the uh i don't know outskirts or i hate to say it ghetto um yeah. of like japan yeah um or even like a korean cinema with like their type of horror that's what i really um, liked about memories of murder oh dude the wailing wailing i didn't has mean to like, watch the wailing yeah that's so uh, highly Dylan recommend. rodriguez talks about it all the time <laughs> Dude, Dylan's got good taste because it's like my one of my favorite horror films of all time. Yeah. Uh, and it like it has like modern Korea, but also just like this really old timey memories of murder type village. Yeah, I guess you could consider Song Kang Ho's character in Memories of Murder like the police version of the salary man. Mm-hmm. Like big time. And they go out with their other police coworkers and shit and I like to think that he thought he was going to make a difference at one point. We're not on this podcast right now, but uh, like, I really do think that his character started off being like, "I'm going to be a police officer." Yeah, I think and that's then, how like, most each, police officers. Start. I know, yeah, but like, like, you know, like, that doesn't mean salarymen can't take pride in their work. They don't. How do you know? Well, they kind of have to. I am a salaryman. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I didn't know you worked that long. Work more than you. We work the same amount of hours. <laughs> yeah, except I have to get before, not for long, but uh, that'll be changing soon. Not for long. But uh, yeah, I don't, I don't have too much to, else to say about Ted. I don't have Turner. too much to add to this movie. You know, it's, uh, check it out. Just a short little episode on uh, this underrated film that's uh, might be a little bit uh, hard to digest for. Uh, westerners but also honestly in general Bert, the the book that or the one we did with throw away your books rally in the streets is a harder to digest than this is 
Um, yeah, no, anywhere. it's just this is very much like not much narrative and very much just like you can take it how you want to basically you know obviously there's themes of escape and stuff like that and conforming and all that good stuff but oh, it's got it. just kind of wanted to see how y'all took to this little 16 yeah it's good i want to check out the sequels uh especially bullet man since it was made in 2009 so i want to see what like stylistically has changed yeah no it's like having a 20 20 year jump between film first film and the last film is kind of interesting for sure and uh it's always interesting when a project uh a director has a project that they you can tell that they wanted to do more back in the day and then they finally get a budget to do crazy shit obviously uh twin peaks the return <laughs> like evil dead yeah it's true um yeah, dude. Uh, I I need to watch the Evil Dead show. I only watched the pilot. I want to watch more of it. Ash versus Evil Dead's good. It just gets like abruptly canceled, though. I know. They want to finish it with like an animated something or the other. Yeah, well, I saw the Trailer Park Boys animated, and I will never trust that again. What? <laughs> I hated the Trailer Park Boys. That's animated. completely different. From I don't this. care. I don't care. You want to know okay. how much I care? <laughs> I don't. All right. Well, movies you guys. All right. This is off the rails now. It's been <laughs> off the rails, but uh, we're gonna end it here, folks. On an early note, um, and we'll be back later this week with some more spooky time thrills from you boys. <laughs> Thanks for listening, everybody.